and we're going to look at creating a one-to-one -one relationship uh, that's persistent in this video. And to do that, we're going to create a new class. Um, so I'm in my coding events project. I've got the project pane on the left, and um, I'm going to open up my event class because the class we're going to create will uh, be referenced in event. Um, and this this class is going to represent a sort of uh, a common pattern or a design pattern, which is um, a lot of times when building an application, you have some object, like in our case, event, that has um, you know a fair number of details associated with it. So that could be, in this case, we just have you know description and contact email. Um, you know, we could have a lot more information there. Suppose there was location and dates and times and, and lots of other information. So um, another common use uh, or another common um, situation in which this pattern is used is when you have a, um, a user object and that user might have a profile. And so that profile is just a collection of details about that specific user. So in such situations, a common pattern is to separate or encapsulate those details about the object into a separate class. And such a class um, should have a one-to-one -one relationship with uh, its parent. So in this case, we're going to create an event details class that will encapsulate all of the sort of metadata about the event. Basically, everything except for um, the name and the category will go into our event details class, and then we'll have a one-to-one -one relationship between event and event details. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Let's go into our models package. Right-click on models. We'll say new Java class, and we'll call this event details. Okay, and the first thing I want to do, as always, with a class that we want to store in our database, let's make this an entity by adding the entity annotation. And I'm going to make some room near the top of it. And uh, what I want to do here is to move the metadata or the, the fields here that have to do with uh, details about our event. I want to move those into the event details class. So I'm just going to cut these out and put them over in event details. So I just cut description and contact email along with their validation annotations. And we need to go back, you notice there's some compiler errors in event. We'll go back and fix those in a moment. Right now, I just want to finish my, um, my class. So let's do uh, generate, or you can right click or, or command N or control N on Windows. Um, and let's generate a constructor that takes both fields. Uh, we will also put a no arg constructor as we always should with um, entities. And uh, let's see, what else do I need? Oh, I need to extend abstract entity. Recall that abstract entities are is the base class for every persistent class that we created. It contains the logic related to IDs, which are our primary keys. So we always need to extend that when we're going to create a new entity class. And then I need getters and setters. So let me getter and setter for description. And down below. The same for contact email. Great. Um, okay, so now I'll go back to event class and I'll fix this. Um, let me clean up these fields in the constructor that are no longer used. Uh, description, contact email. Okay, so I need to take out these two parameters. I'm going to leave category. And then down below, I need to take out the associated getters and setters as well. Great. OK, so now I want to relate my event details class to my event class. So I'm going to create a private event details field. And uh, similarly, uh, let's see, I'll make a getter and setter for this field. Okay, and to set up this relationship, I'm going to use a JPA annotation similar to what we did with one to many and many to one. I'm going to use one to one, and that will uh, have the effect of creating a foreign key column on our event table that references the event details table. One more thing I need to do here, is, uh, in addition to adding one to one, I'm going to add the at valid annotation, and the reason why we need this. Uh, and this annotation, for me at least, sometimes uh, IntelliJ has trouble figuring out the right import for it. So I'm going to add the import manually. It's uh, import Java X dot validation dot valid. Okay. So 
the, the reason why we add this at valid annotation is that when we want to validate um, our new event objects in the controller, when we're, you know, we have a, a handler method um, that's handling form submission and there's model binding going on, when we add the at valid to that event, it won't validate um, objects that are contained within the event. It'll only validate uh, the top level fields, or the, you know, like, uh, for example, um, uh, name and, and category. Um, and actually, let me put not null on this too. So, um, I could put not null on event details, and so the validation that would happen then is uh, it would be checking to make sure that there was an event details object, but it wouldn't go down into those into that object to check the details of the fields. So while we have in our event details class, we have these validation annotations on description and email, those would not be checked without this at valid annotation on event details. Okay, great. And so um, we you know we could add. Uh, an event details object to our constructor, or you could, you know, we could have left the um, the the email and uh, and description fields there and use those to create a new event details in our constructor. Um, we're not going to need to do that for the purposes of our controller, but if your if your application ever needed to do that, you would feel free to to do that as well. Um, we're going to use model binding, which uh, uses the, the the setter for this field to populate the field. Okay, great. So um, I think we're good here. Let's go to our um, we're going to need to update our templates and our controllers, at least. So let's go to let's go to create. Oh, that's the wrong create. So let me go to events create. There we go. So this is the form that creates is used to uh, create a new event object, and we have to update this um, because. We're referencing fields off of events that are no longer there. In particular, we're saying that, you know, here we have th field and event dot description. Um, that is no longer uh, an object in or a field in that in that class. So what we need to do is we can still we still need to reference the description. We still want to require users to add a description and contact email and create a new events. But it's just the fact is that the that field is located in a different place now so it's actually let me delete this and say event dot event details since that's the name of the field that holds the details and description and i'm going to do the same thing down here in the errors block and then i'm going to do the same thing i can just copy paste this actually and put it in the middle i'm going to do the same thing for the, for the email field so um, this now will properly um, use the event details fields to uh, generate names and error messages and things like that in the form elements. Okay, and that's our create template that should work now. Let's uh, while we're in template land, let's look at the other template that we'll need to modify for this, which is index. And so similar deal here, we have fields being referenced off of event that no longer exist. Those now live off of the events details sub object, our child object. And uh, I think that's good. Cool. That should that should work. All right. And let's look at our controller to make sure that our controller is okay. So we need to look at a couple of places. We need to look at uh, let's see. Oh, yep, down towards the bottom, the create event form. So um, when we display create event form, um, we're passing in an event object, and that'll that'll still be okay. And uh, when we have our um, process create event form, we're going to use model binding here. And it, it's not obvious that this will just work, but it actually will. Um, setting up the th field uh, settings on the on the contact email and the description fields, um, those. As long as they're correct, Spring Boot will be, be uh, able to correctly put those into um, an event details object within the event class when model binding occurs. And so this at valid and model attribute, this will all mean that that sub object gets wired up correctly using model binding. Okay, and um, there's one thing we need to do, um, and uh, that is to consider what happens when we carry out an action on our new event. So, when this when this handler gets called, um, when this handler gets called, it will uh, it will create a new event object with the details from the field, so the category and the name and the event details object that contains description 
and uh, also the contact email. It'll be created and it'll be validated. Uh, and then when we get down here to this line of code, when we're trying to save that event, um, the sub object also needs to be saved. The event details object that belongs to our event object also needs to be saved. However, it's not explicitly saved. So there are a couple things we could do here. We could either we could either uh, you know use a event details repository to you know to save that. We don't have an event details repository currently, but we can make one and then we could save that event that sub object and then we could save this object. Um, the better thing to do, though, however, is to actually introduce a new concept called Cascade. And this is a, a common ORM um, concept. And what it does is it allows you to specify in the relationship between two objects how operations, uh, how ORM operations are applied to subobjects. So in this case, this event details objects, we want to be able to specify whenever an event is saved, also save the associated event details object. And so we can do that in the one-to-one -one annot uh, annotation, which establishes the relationship. And we add a cascade parameter, and uh, we want to say equals um, cascade type dot all. And so cascade type is essentially a static class. All is a static value off of this class. And it's, this this will uh, tell Hibernate to cascade every operation on an event object down into its event details subobject. So if we delete an event object, then that event details object should also be deleted. If we save the event object, uh, the event details should also be saved, etc. There are several values for cascade type. All is is probably the most commonly used. Uh, let me show you what they look like here, and we'll get them in the in the little uh, IntelliJ. Uh, IntelliSense pop-up. There's all, detach, merge, persist, refresh, remove. Those are all values you could use. Um, we're gonna leave it to you to you know, read more about those um, and, and use them in your application or your project code as necessary. Um, the only one we're gonna need for this project, and again, one of the most commonly used ones, is the, is the cascade all. Great, so let's now start up our application and test it out. Okay, let's start up. We'll go to a browser and navigate to localhost 8080. And look at all events. Okay, so let's see. We have an exception here. And uh, I know what this exception is. Let's, well, let, me, let me point out the details here. So uh, let's see. We're caused by spring EL expression. And so this looks like it's in our template, in our index template, which is Correct. That's the view we're trying to render, and it's saying that events dot event details dot description um, is the problem. Uh, line twenty one, column thirteen. So let's look at what that is. Line twenty one, column thirteen. So it's line twenty one. So it's here where we had to rename the the field here that's being referenced. Okay, and. Uh, this exception isn't very helpful. There we go. Bottom one. Property or field description cannot be found on null. So this says, basically it's saying our event details object is null for the given event. And this is uh, something we've encountered before and you will you will continuously encounter as long as you're working with ORM, is that uh, when you change your ORM setup in your code, you frequently need to um, update your database as well. And in our case, um, let me delete a lot of this stuff. This is the things I was working on earlier. Um, let me go to coding events and tables. And we see we do have an event details table right now, which is uh, empty. Or actually, there's there's one thing in there, but that's from earlier work I was doing. Um, the the event uh, table, let's look at the event table. So the event details uh, column here is what is going to be storing the foreign key value of an event details object. And for um, objects which are previously created, uh, the values are null. So we need to basically truncate this table. I'm going to truncate both of these to just start fresh. So I'll truncate them in details. Oh, maybe we need to do event first. Just so we can start out with a clean. Uh, okay, so. This is, I, I was doing some other work to prepare for these lessons and I didn't clean up my database properly. So I got to do some extra work here that you won't have to do. So I had this, this tag and event tags uh, table that all have relationships to each other. And that's stuff we'll learn about in a future lesson. I should have deleted this before the video, but I did not. So now I can go in and should be able to, we'll just try, actually, you know what? Let's just drop everything. 
let's start totally fresh. So I'm going to drop all my tables. And so if you if you run into issues like this, um, you know we're not working on a production application. We're just testing. Hibernate's going to create the tables from scratch for us if it needs to. Dropping them all is is a pretty safe thing to do. That makes that makes sure that your schema is correct uh, when the application starts. So I'll restart my application so that the tables get regenerated. I don't have any data in there, but that's good because then when I create the data, it'll conform to the new schema based on uh, my new object relational mapping. We just saw those hibernate create messages fly through here too. So this is hibernate creating uh, the tables that we need, event, event category, event details, adding the constraints based on the relationship and all that stuff. So um, those should be good now. Let's go to the application and we will try to load this page again. Okay, no events but the page rendered correctly, which is good. Let's go to create a category. We need a category before we can create an event. Okay, so I've got a category now. Let me go to uh, create an event. And I'm gonna leave that event in the conference category. And I created that event. So um, this functionality hasn't changed from the user's perspective. So this is this is classic refactoring. Let's go look at the table and see what's or the databases and see what's different with our tables. So I need to refresh my schema's pane to get the new stuff. And let me close down my existing tabs. And I will go to first. Let's go to the event table. Notice now this event table does not have description and email fields on it. It does now, however, have an event details ID column, which is, as we said before, this is the foreign key column into our event details table. So all the details for this object are being stored in this table over here. So let's look at event details. This is where we now have contact email and description. And so the, the, uh, the ID 14 is referenced. If we go back here, we see that that is the, the, the primary key for the event details object. It's the foreign key here in the event details ID. And so we refactored here to uh, encapsulate all the details about our events in a separate class, and those classes have uh, that class has a one-to-one -one relationship with the event class. Now, one thing I'll I'll just mention here: we're not going to actually do it. Um, I'll show you how you can do it, though. If this this only establishes the relationship in one direction, in other words, um, an event knows about an associated event details object, but an event details object does not know about the event that owns it. If you wanted to create the inverse relationship, in other words, if you wanted your event details objects to know which event they were associated with, uh, it would be pretty easy to do that. So you would come in here and say, add a new private field of type event. And this is similar to what we, we saw previously with uh, with our one-to-many uh, relationships. And so I have that and I add the one-to-one. -one. Now, however, I need to specify that this is mapped by event details. And so this says, in order to populate, this tells Hibernate, in order to populate this field, go look for the event object that has the event details field that points to the given event details object. So uh, this won't create a new foreign key column or anything like that. Uh, in other words, it'll just use the foreign key column that already exists. And so it tells, tells Hibernate to look at the event details field in this class in order to set up that relationship. So that's how you can create the inverse relationship. This application doesn't need that, so we're not going to do it. Um, I just cluttered up our code, so I'll delete it. But if you ever want to do that, it's pretty easy to set up the inverse relationship as well.